Am I the only person who thinks that heaven sounds like the most boring place ever the way it is normally described? The classic sitting on clouds, strumming harps, and singing praises for millions of years is closer to my idea of hell than paradise. I don't want to sing the same song over and over and over. I'm a horrible singer. And why would everyone be playing the same instrument? And who in their right mind wants to just sit on something for their entire eternity? But fortunately, this idea actually isn't based on very good scripture at all. And the problem is that the Old Testament doesn't talk about heaven at all, really. I mean, the word is mentioned as sky or invisible place where God is, but not as a destination for us, not as a place to be. It is only in the New Testament that we get any form of description of heaven as a place for us. And most of the images that we instinctively use for heaven actually come from just one book. Revelation. Even more specifically, they mostly come from Revelation chapter 21. And this is a problem because that chapter is a description not of heaven, but of the rebuilt New Jerusalem that comes to the new earth and is a symbol of how wonderful life restored will be. It's not a picture of heaven at all. The golden streets, the pearly gates, are about a rebuilt Jerusalem. And this beautiful imagery was particularly important at the time Revelation was written because Jerusalem itself had just been destroyed and all of God's people were scattered to the winds. So this was a promise that what the people had seen was not the end, that it was not a lost golden age, a richer, more golden, more amazing time was still to come. But to make that point, it has to be about an actual place on earth, an actual Jerusalem, not Heaven. But this isn't to say that the Bible doesn't describe what heaven is like or paint pictures of what our time with God will be like. Jesus talks quite a bit about what is to come for God's people, and he uses predominantly one image, marriage. The word wedding is used 76 times in the Bible. 58 of those are in the New Testament, and all but two of those are in the Gospels. The other two? Revelation. Almost all the uses of the term marriage and marry in the New Testament are also focused in the Gospels because Jesus talks about this a lot. Quite a few of Jesus' parables are about weddings and specifically brides waiting for their grooms to come. Today, that might not make a lot of sense, but back then, most marriages were arranged when both parties were fairly young. And so when the parents believed that they were finally grown up and ready enough, the groom would build a house for his bride and himself, or in most cases, build a room onto his father's house for them. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, In my father's house are many rooms. If there weren't, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you so that we can be together. It's a wedding image of a groom preparing to be married by building onto his father's house a place for them to be together. Other parables also use marriage imagery, often with the theme of waiting. Jesus tells a story of the wise and foolish bridemaids waiting for the groom to come and get his bride, and how some got tired of waiting and fell asleep. He also tells the story of the kingdom of God being like a wedding banquet for the son, to which everyone is invited. Jesus puts himself in the role of groom, explaining in Mark that his people are celebrating because that's what guests do when the groom is with them. He is with them, so they eat and drink and enjoy life because it won't always be the case. Paul talks about the church as the bride of Christ, and Revelation picks up the same theme as well, talking about the wedding of the Lamb, meaning Jesus. So throughout the New Testament, one of, if not the dominant way of talking about our relationship with God is through the lens of marriage. A marriage that is promised and anticipated, but not yet fully realized. And heaven is described as the place where that marriage truly begins. Now, how much the sexual element of marriage enters into this is open for debate, especially as the marriage is between Christ and the church, not Christ and us as individuals. But we can say for certain that attraction certainly wasn't the driving force behind marriage back then like it is today. Instead, the focus on marriage, and in particular the focus on these parables, is on the expectation and anticipation of what is to come. That there is uncertainty, maybe trepidation about the future, but also there is a new life coming. Another common theme in the Bible. And with that new life comes intimacy and union. 
that we will be taken away from our old life and whisked off to a new one prepared for us, where we won't be abandoned or ignored. If you are married, think back to those days of growing to know each other, of falling in love, not with the other person's body, but with their mind and heart and soul. That is what heaven is envisioned in the New Testament. The growing to know each other and love each other as we begin a new life together, filled with new adventures together. It's not the ending of something, it's the beginning of something so much better. That is far more exciting image of the future to me than just sitting on a cloud with a harp or walking golden streets. And if heaven is envisioned as marriage, then that can also help shape our understanding of marriage. That it is in itself meant to be a precursor to what we can have with God. That perhaps the very purpose of marriage is to show us glimpses of the sort of love that God has for us. Because after all, we can only know what we have seen or experienced. How could we know God's self-giving love without an example in front of us, like marriage? Now, of course, not every marriage looks like heaven. Some are miniature versions of hell, absolutely. But at its best, marriage is the best path we have to see glimpses of the kind of love that God has for us. And marriage is also the best way Jesus had of telling us what our lives in heaven would be like. That it will be like exploring our new life with a spouse, full of joy and surprises, new ideas, shared time together, basking in each other's presence, and looking for ways to serve and to show love. And for me, that both encourages me about heaven and inspires me with something to live up to in my own marriage. Because in a very real sense, my marriage is showing the people around me, especially my wife and children, a little glimpse of heaven. Or it should be. Thanks for sticking around. Next week will be a look at marriage in the 21st century. Is it still relevant? What does it mean? Who can do it? I think it'll be really interesting. But until then, as always, thanks for watching. Have a great week. See you next Friday.